to First Congregational United Church of Christ in La Crosse, Wisconsin. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. You are welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Lent. It has been one year since we began gathering virtually. It's March 14th, 2021. If you're joining us from the link in the e-greeting, you can click on another link in that same email that has a PDF that links the order of service. There, you will find all of the other materials that will help you worship with us so that it is a full congregational experience. You'll find the hymns and those portions that call the congregation to join with us in prayer, pardon, and assurance of pardon. So, I invite you to open that up on your tablet or print it out and worship with us. Also today, we are taking in the offering that is gathered from the whole United Church of Christ. It is an offering called One Great Hour of Sharing. It goes to communities around the world that have experienced natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, all sorts of things, and especially in this time of COVID that has exposed the infrastructural insecurities of the world around us. It has been helping communities around the world meet the needs that they are experiencing. So we invite you to mail in your gift to One Great Hour of Sharing to the church office at 2503 Main Street, La Crosse, Wisconsin. You can also go to the website, www firstcongolax.org. There, you'll find a tab that says Give. Click on that tab, follow the prompts, and then you'll see about midway down, it says One Great Hour of Sharing. And there, you can share your gift that will go to the wider world to ensure that God's justice goes out in material form that people can feel and sense in their everyday life. We thank you for your continued support of this congregation as well as this offering. We also hope that you received this week in the mail a business size envelope if you are a member of the church. There is a question in there and we invite you to answer that question and send it back in a timely fashion. So, thank you for joining us for worship. We invite you to now prepare your hearts and your minds to enter into worship.
in mercy has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, grace we have been saved, saved by faith. faith. And, and this, this is not our own doing. It, it is the gift of God. God.
In Christ, we are made new. In the Holy Spirit, we are made a new community. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with you. A reading from the book of Numbers in chapter 21. From Mount Hor, they set out, by the way, to the Red Sea to go around to the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. We will now join in reading responsibly from Psalm 107 as printed in the order of service. Oh, give thanks to God. For God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of God say so, those whom God redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and the west, from the north and the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to God in their trouble, and God saved them from their distress. God sent out God's word and healed them, and delivered them from destruction. Let them give thanks for God's steadfast love, for God's wonderful works to humankind. And let, let them, them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and, and tell of God's deeds with songs of joy. A reading from the Gospel according to John in chapter 3. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true, come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Oh, 
Good morning. I'm Curtis Miller, and it's very good to be with you here today uh, and in your, visiting with you in your homes uh, today as we worship together. Like most people, I have spent a lot more time at home because of COVID. And unfortunately, that means I have watched more TV than usual. Sometimes I go on Netflix and watch dystopian shows. Saying that here in church makes, it, makes me feel like I'm offering a confession. Uh, maybe that's uh, because my wife, Andrea, doesn't like those kinds of shows. She feels like they're a little too dark or violent. And sometimes she's right. Anyway, whether you like the genre of dystopian dramas or not, you probably know what they look like. Sometimes there is a mass of people living in chaos after a natural disaster. Sometimes the plot is more Orwellian, with a peasant class resisting oppressive overlords in an overly militarized society. Sometimes there are small bands of people surviving in a jungle or traversing a desert. Whatever the particulars, the situation is always desperate. The characters have to be inventive just to survive. They have to reorganize their societies, sometimes forging new alliances amid quickly changing power structures. The reason I've been talking about dystopian Netflix dramas here is that when I hear our first reading from the Book of Numbers, and I try to picture it in my mind, well, it ends up looking like a dystopian movie. I think you know the story. The Hebrews have escaped slavery, escaping from Egypt. They are wandering in the wilderness, traveling, trying to get to a land of promise. But the desert is filled with challenges and dangers. And this time, it is snakes. The people are dying from snake bites. So Moses talks with God. Moses puts the form of a bronze snake on a pole. When the people look at it, they are healed of their snake bites. It is, I must confess, an odd story to be in the Bible. Because if you remember, just last week, the reading for the, the Old Testament lesson was the Ten Commandments. And making idols is violation number one. The most important commandment, you shall not make any graven images. What a messy history we have. What a messy faith we sometimes have. The Bible can be just like that. There's also a lot of historical messiness going on in the Gospel lesson for today, but you might not see it at first. It takes a little digging to find it. But let me summarize the main points. In the dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus, Nicodemus is introduced as a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling Jewish council. Their conversation reveals that Jesus is going to be executed we are given portents that conflict and violence is coming. And it does. First, with the execution of Jesus. Then we have, later on, full-scale open Jewish revolt against the Romans. This occurred first in the Jewish-Roman War of 66. 30 years later, 33 years later to be precise in terms of our mathematics. And then in the year 70, Rome lays siege to Jerusalem. Titus, as this is in the Roman records of the war, Titus began his siege a few days before Passover on the 14th of April, surrounding the city of Jerusalem with three legions on the western side and a fourth legion on the Mount of Olives. Jerusalem was filled with pilgrims at the time because of the Passover. During the pilgrimage festival, the population of this city swelled by tenfold, going from around 100,000 to over a million people. The timing of the siege was chosen by the Romans for maximum effect. 
The legions of Roman soldiers overwhelmed the city. The city was burned. The temple was destroyed, being pulled down stone by stone. The Jewish historian Josephus says a million Jews were massacred. And any survivors became Roman prisoners. It was a dystopian scene. And this is the historical situation from which the Gospel of John emerged. The Gospel of John was the last Gospel written. It was written 20 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. While the Roman Jewish War continued to simmer on, John began writing. And as you might imagine, it, his writing, his Gospel, has some dystopian themes. The social structure has been reconfigured. The ruling class of Sadducees are gone, as are the priests. They're just no longer there. The governing Sanhedrin is gone. The Zealots, the Essenes, all these different Jewish groups are gone. The only ones left are the Pharisees and Messianic Jews. They are the groups that survived. And for a while, they coexist in the synagogue, adapting to survive the loss of the temple. But slowly, the Messianic Jews, the people that we now call Christians, separate from the synagogue. And this is the situation in which John begins writing about the good news of Messiah Jesus, Jesus the Christ. It is a dystopian time. A time when everything is changing. And the land is filled with darkness. So how is it that John, as he begins to write, begins to write about good news and writes as if he's, it's the beginning of a whole new age? In the very first verses, the first five verses of the book of John, he introduces Jesus as a force within a new creation. They're familiar words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life. And the light was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How can that be? How can people still have hope in such a violent, cruel world? In John 3, we learn something fundamental has changed in this new creation that is emerging in the midst of an old world. In this new creation, it is not humans who offer sacrifice to God. It is God who offers a sacrifice to humans. God's own love suffers and dies in Jerusalem. So as to finally unmask and annul the system of murderous mendacity, which so often fills our world. This is a deep spiritual truth. It is a powerful, nuanced truth. It is not a self-evident truth. So John has to restate it, actually, a number of times, both in his Gospel and in his Epistle. At the beginning of his Epistle, he says it this way, This, then, is the message which we have heard from Jesus, and declare it unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Friends, we can trust God because God's being is entirely without violence, darkness, duplicity, ambivalence, ambiguity. At the end of the epistle, John sums it up again. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Here we have 
the element of the discovery of the absolutely life-giving, effervescent nature of God leading to the realization that behind the death of Jesus there was no violent God, but a loving God who was giving of God's self to get us out of our violent and sinful lives. Now this doesn't mean that there is no more darkness. In a world so full of injustice, there is so much saving and judging that needs to be done, that there is plenty of light, there is plenty of darkness, and there is every shade of gray in between. And that is okay, because it is all part of the work of redemption that is the work of creation, the creation of the new world, of the new life, the new age. What it means is that we too, you and I, can trust the light of God's love that continues to shine in our darkness. And yes, we have spent time in the shadows lately. We have spent the last year in social isolation while half a million people died of COVID. Insurrectionists attacked our Capitol building, seeking to throw, overthrow our government. Our economy continues to churn on, assaulting the Earth's fragile ecosystem. Millions in our own land, our wealthy land, make less than a living wage. And yet our governing body can't raise the minimum wage. Hate is still prevalent. Yes, these are things to be very concerned about because they cast a dark shadow over our lives, over our love for our neighbors. But God loves the world. And that power is at work in our time, recreating this world through love. And it shows up in every Christian community. It shows up in every Christian heart as we put our hands to work in our community, making it a better place. And it all adds up to making the new world, that new creation that Jesus was talking about. To paraphrase Reinhold Deaver, who was a great teacher of the church and actually a good member of the UCC, Reinhold Niebuhr wrote a book that was called Children of Light and Children of Darkness. He was a social ethicist who studied these social problems that often befall us. And he reminds us that we can trust the power of a new creation is at work in our lives and our history because Christ continues to empower our virtue and our love. He reminds us that God's divine mercy understands and resolves the perpetual contradictions in which history is involved. This is our faith. This is the faith that makes it possible to deal with the ultimate social problems of human history. This is the faith that allows us to trust that the light of God is shining in the darkness. Amen. <laughs>
Let us pray to the one whose steadfast love endures forever, the one who has redeemed and is redeeming all creation from destruction and trouble. For God's community that has been gathered virtually from the east, the west, the north, and the south, from the villages of Norwalk to the towns of Holman, on Alaska, and La Crosse. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For a nation divided, a nation that finds it difficult to trust our neighbor, that we may be overtaken by empathy and love for one another. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For our local community, growing weary from virtual gatherings and exhausted by distance from friends and the church, that we may find patience with our neighbors and ourselves. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the earth and all that is in her, that your creation may be healed from the wounds we have inflicted upon her. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all who ask for prayer and those known only to you, for Eileen, Kaylin, Heather, Andy, Leanna, Adam, Joanne, Carol, Jenny. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those who have died, especially those who have showed us how to love and patiently work for your justice that is coming, that they may be at peace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Merciful God, let us walk these 40 days of Lent with Jesus, who taught us to pray boldly. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
through deeds of love and worshipful actions. Keep fellowship with one another at all times and in all things. Keep the faith. The blessing of Almighty God, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer be with you this day and always. Amen. Thank you.